Hello, our friends, Evolutionary Energy Arts family. Hello there. Welcome back. So, guys, I've been wanting to do this, and we do have a created playlist here, and Sita's excited about it, too. And this playlist is a new, deeper look into the Bible. Oh, yeah. And there's already six videos up there. There's, I think, really more, but um, they are... Some of them are not, uh, well, they're not exposed because we had strikes against us on evolutionary and we're afraid of having the channel removed. That's happened many, many times. So already there are some here for you guys to go check out. The top one there is Shocking Bible Verses inside the most published book in history. Yes, it's the most published book in history. By far, nothing is even close. Oh, yes. It's it's a deep, intricate web. And, you know, we're going to break this down into small pieces because there's a lot to digest and a lot to ponder and contemplate. We want to thank our Patreons again for your support. We couldn't do it without your support over at Patreon. And before we get going, you know, again, we want to reiterate that we are absolutely not atheists. Uh, we do believe there's a creator of this universe. There is a source of all things. And we ultimately view that Yeshua, Jesus' message, is one of love and compassion and peace. And yet, there's a lot to disagree with when it comes to our modern interpretation of the B-I-B-L-E. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that people feel that they need to protect when it comes to that B-I-B-L-E. They, they find that they need to defend it sometimes, and sometimes they feel they need to defend it through certain threats. And even to the point where if someone doesn't believe them or believe in what they believe in, they feel the only way to deal with that person is to completely shun them out of their lives. So it is defended to a very high degree, which I find strange. You know, usually if somebody feels good about their belief system, they're very open about other belief systems. They're actually more in a state of curiosity than defending. And so we're going to look at one aspect in this particular video, and it's a really, really basic aspect that we should look at, and that's understanding, like, every time you see this, the word G-O-D, or the word L-O-R-D. It's not the original word. What you have to realize is we have many different languages in play here. And some is in Greek, some in Aramaic, some in Hebrew. Uh, then there's translations that have happened from either Aramaic uh, to, say, Latin. And then <laughs> maybe... Uh, into Hebrew, into English, and, and there's, there's many in between. Again, it's a really tangled and twisted web. And so when you're looking at this, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. The heaven and the earth. <sighs> well, it, it's not really even what we truly read when we go back to the earliest translations. I just want to give you guys something to ponder here. When we look to, say, Old English, because we're using English, if, if we're talking about Old English, and we could even just go back maybe three, four hundred years, or we could go back certainly a thousand years, and if you were speaking English, you probably wouldn't be able to understand a word they were saying, the people that were alive at that time. Maybe a little, a little. Look, look at this. And they hastening came on the Hig F. What the heck? Right? And found Mary and Joseph and Gemetron, Gemetron, Marian and Iosip. Yeah, a again, and the child in a manger laid. You can see, it, it, it is definitely, well, it could be a little bit confusing. Could it not even just using the same language in different time periods? I mean, just think about, we were listening to um, a Scottish guy 
And I was asking Cindy, what language do you think he's speaking? And she kept saying, I think he's speaking Dutch. No, he was speaking English, sweetie. <laughs> he was speaking English. But he was from the Highlands of Scotland. And us over here in the U.S. could, could not understand hardly anything he was saying. So again, what you have to realize is there's a lot of time lapse. There's a lot lost in translation. And we're talking about translation from, in many cases, languages that are, are dead or uh, utilized, but really only in a scholarly way now. And again, sometimes jumping from one language to another and then translating from that into a third or even into a fourth. It, it's, it's not that simple. And you could look at this. Uere fadir What's that? Is that a P or is that a B? Mm -hmm. Art in Huynh, uh, Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy. Can you just see, just even looking at old English to modern English, how complicated this could be? And so, you, you know, they won't want to admit it, but there's a lot of guessing that takes place. An awful lot of guessing. And more than that, too. Because we, we do have, again, uh, transcriptions which which do contain well you know they're either contradictions or they're looking at it from different points of view and you know you could go on and on with that but but the reality is also that when we're talking Hebrew and this is something to really understand in Hebrew the scribes did not write down vowels and that is so key. It was up to the translator to figure out what vowels to put in. So if you want to look at this, and if we take out all the vowels, then, you know, father becomes F-T-H-R. Well, you know, what if you stick an O in there? What if you stick a U in there or an I in there? You're going to change meanings totally. So again, I've heard it said, and I've had beloved friends that I completely disagreed with, that I couldn't get through their heads, some some of them, uh, that, you know, oh, the Bible's perfect. There's there's not one inconsistency or one error. And I'd be like, well, have you looked at the oldest uh, book of John that we have? Have you looked at the oldest gospel of John? There's words crossed out by the hundreds and corrections inlaid because it wasn't an easy job to translate. This, this is part that people have to first understand. Look at this. How many people would know H-A-L, WID, is hallowed? Again, and this is the same language, let alone translating from languages other than English. Oh my gosh, translation is such a huge deal. Because when you're dealing with translation, you're also dealing with someone else's perception. And their perception is going to go right along the lines with however they were raised, their personal life experiences, uh, what they were taught, who taught them. So you're going to get a translation based on their, you know, how they see the world through their life sequences. And, and that can really vary greatly. I mean, think about from the time you were like 10 to the time you were 15 to the time you were 20 and all the same information, if it were given to you, you would be translating that completely different from one, one step to the next to the next. And even look at our school system. They rewrite the science books and the books yearly, yearly to the point if you have an eighth grader and... That say they have an older brother in the 11th grade. Well, the 11th grade grader is not able to help the 8th grader because the, the information in that school has changed that much. Can you imagine? That's only a few years difference. Could you imagine hundreds of years? Hundreds? It, there's going to be differences. Absolutely. You know, and again, remember that history is being revised constantly. Constantly. That old saying, history is written by the victors. Well, who are the victors? Well, the modern established, uh, <laughs> the modern established power complex, which we have in place today, which really, you know, yes, there are many different denominations and many different branches of Christianity, 
but they are really coming from the same root today for the most part. Now, there could be little ones out outside of the mainstream that do understand the bigger picture, and there is, and that's growing too. But let's start with what God really means, because again, every time you see the word God or Lord, there could be one of many different other words, different words in that place that all get translated as either God or Lord. But they're not all the same word, and they don't have the same meanings. And some of them have a different meaning today than they had in the past. So when you look at this right away, just with this knowledge alone, you obviously know that the answer is uh, no, uh, the Bible is not the inerrant word of God because there's errors made by humans translating it by the hundreds and thousands. By the hundreds and thousands. So what you have to realize uh, is that, yes, there is an awful lot of room for error. So I'm going to read you a, a short excerpt from the book by Mauro Bellino, uh, Gods of the Bible, Gods in the Plural. So let's start with a few short pages devoted to the terms for God. In particular, we ask ourselves, does Elohim mean God or not? Because when we look to the very first statement here, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. Well, the oldest original word used was Elohim. Elohim. That's plural. That's obviously, this, this sentence is wrong. It's totally wrong. Because it's using a plural word. And so, again, our modern theology is all about trying to solve the errors that come up in translation. Is the <laughs> In other words, it's spin. It's spin. It's what the politicians do. Or, you know, is it something that they need something to be put in, in in its place so that it can be more convenient to possibly, you know, direct people in a certain area that just makes it easy to really control a lot of people, control the masses. So here we have Elohim. This is from Bible Study Tools. It's a plural word. Now, it can mean... And the oldest translations we have literally do translate to rulers, judges, mighty ones, divine ones, or the gods. Now, it, it can be interpreted as angels, uh, but malachim is the Hebrew for angels. So it's not really uh, going to translate directly into angels. It certainly doesn't translate into Trinity, as the Trinity itself was a concept that was debated ad nauseum in the early church. And, you know, so it, it's not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit having a debate amongst themselves, as some people would like to put out there. So when you understand this, the oldest wor words are really talking about rulers, judges, mighty ones, powerful beings. And, you know, it's fascinating, too. Um, I'm going to go off on a tiny tangent, but I think it's an interesting tangent. In the mountains of North Carolina, there is uh, there are legends of a giant, which, you know, again, is, you know, giants are uh, abundant, and we're going to go into the giants, too, because the giants uh, are misunderstood, and there's many different giants that get lumped into one category, and in fact, they are, uh, in many cases, the victims of a genocide, and we'll go into that as well in subsequent videos, but what did this giant, his name was Judicola, what did he do? He held court. And in fact, there is a place called, now by the, uh, the English-speaking people, the Devil's Courthouse. And it is a rock outcropping on the top of a mountain there in the Appalachians that he would hold court. And he would judge over the Native Americans, other giants, and even non-physical beings. Now, this is a really telling reveal. 
Because, you know, in some ways, you could definitely say he was an Elohim. Mm -hmm. One of those, one of those beings. So, you know, it does really come down to the translations. And I've, I've told you guys many times in my spiritual journey, I was wanting to be like the best person I could be and understand the Bible and go to church and volunteer for Sunday school, all of these things. But somewhere in my heart, I knew things didn't sit right something just wasn't right and it took a long time for me to want to face that because I wanted I needed something to be right in my life I needed something to be good to be pure to be honest and to me this was like the most you know this is the biggest thing that I can dive myself into and I know that I'm not making an error but even still it didn't feel right it never felt right so even if you want to try to translate Elohim as God's God, you have to go God's with an S because it's plural. And the root is L. L is the root of Elohim. So if you're looking to who, well, then who's L? What's L? L is the leader of all Canaanite gods in the plural. Again, a pantheon. What we have with the Bible is basically they went from pushing well actually they didn't have to push it i should re i should rephrase that they went from what was a polytheistic viewpoint of things to a monotheistic viewpoint at a latter date they revised and changed everything to just being one god one deity now i'll tell you straight out cindy and i believe there is one source of all things and we do think that there was a a creator of this universe that is the grand architect, so to speak, of this universe. Uh, but again, that grand architect was, you know, not alone. He was joined, you know, by many other beings in, in making and manifesting this universe. You know, there's, there's something I talk about every now and then, and I really want to sit down and, and channel this information uh, about a, a moment I shared with source and sources energy and having that understanding that yes, it is something that it far supersedes our ability to understand when we're here in these bodies, but knowing that you do come from a perfect love, an absolute perfect force of love feels really good but when we're looking into the bible and you read the word lord or god you just you keep you have to put the word in there you know which lord or which god because it could be one of hundreds it could be one of hundreds and you know it's just something that's been ongoing and you really have to find the truth within yourself absolutely and again when we look to the three major divisions of what we would call biblical texts for those that have gone deeper into the theology you would know that there's the Eloist, there's the Yahwist, and then we have the Masoretic uh, texts too and so when we look at the Masoretic texts again we're talking about the priestly cast of translators the translators that, again, it was up to them to insert the vowels because the vowels were not written down. So, again, if you have one person translating it uh, one way, and, again, <laughs> there's tons of errors because you could look at the, the most ancient ones that we have as far as uh, the scriptural, quote-unquote, writings, and you'll see, you know, things crossed out, things noted, things rewritten it's just natural because again th these things were passed on orally first oral traditions so el is the leader of all the canaanite gods in the plural the creator lives on mount saphon el is represented by an older man sometimes also appears with bull's horns which symbolize strength Within the red tent, El stands as the god of men, namely Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He will later exist as Yahweh to the he Hebrews. Well, you know, again, what we have to do is to look closely be because uh, you, can, you, can't, you can't take for granted any singular person's uh, interpretation. And this is why, you know, double check me, go do your, your own research 
and you know <laughs> look from look into a variety of different sources you know when i started on this i was starting out really i i kind of went full circle because you know at first i was born catholic and then on my own started going to a baptist church and then from there i wanted to go to the earliest church i could possibly find and and went from one to another to another meaning the most um original version where's the original where's what the apostles themselves were talking about and living and again in this world in this age it's hard to know for sure it really really is because everything is always being rewritten and when you look to the bible the word l is used to denote god lord etc many many times the word yahweh is used as well like six thousand plus times and there's many other words in there as well so what we have with the canaanites again the israelites came to canaan that was the promised land that yahweh promised them according to the bible now again the native americans uh you know if the european colonists said hey this is our promised land well we've been here for thousands of years sorry our god promised it to us oh boy here goes here goes exactly what we have going on time and time and time again yeah so again what is the real translation now with the canaanites again there's a multiplicity of, of these heavenly beings. And really what we find is that most of these beings are extraterrestrial. And when we get that kingship was brought from on high, it literally means kingship came out of the sky and came here in technology. And again, it's so fascinating to look at uh, how things are mistranslated now. Of course, and I've said this so many times, if this world is run by Satan, meaning the adversary to humanity, then of course the mainstream belief systems are going to be Satan's belief systems. That should be a given. It should be just so beyond obvious. Mm -hmm. You know, the religious system being that number one system that they want you or need you to believe. It's <laughs> They need you to believe that to continue on doing what they're doing. But if you are an advanced ancient race and you needed a place to conquer or a place to call your own home it would be very advantageous to work from the shadows and work from a place where humans couldn't see you and when you look at things you look at some of the things like um the pyramids or you look at some of these uh like stone castles that were just carved out of stone i mean you can't tell me that that was created with a chisel and a hammer like they taught us in school. You have to start looking at these things. I mean, when you want to dig for the truth, you have to start looking at it for what it is. And I don't think that the pyramids were made with chisels and hammers. And I don't think that these uh, castles were made <laughs> with some polishing cloths and chisels and hammers either. There was an advanced race that was here. Yeah, absolutely. So when we talk about uh, the mythos of this area, uh, it, it, it gives us really the exact same. And now this, we're talking about uh, Canaan, modern day Israel, Syria, Lebanon. It has the same mythological power structure that we see over in uh, Babylon, Sumeria. It's the same. There's gods and there's goddesses. And there's and not only that, but there's different classes of gods. The universe was believed to be ruled in tandem by the older god El and the main warrior god Baal, surrounded by a council of deities. That word council of deities is ah, oh, council of the gods, the council of nine. That goes back to the Greek mythology. Yeah, you know, again, when we're looking at this, we are talking again about the Anunnaki and the Gigi. Uh, so, you know, again, you have this council of deities and the lower level of attendant gods. Divine council included the older generation of the god El 
and his wife Atherah, also known in the Bible as Asherah, as well as a younger group of figures that included the war god Baal and the war goddess Anat and Astarte. Uh, forces of destruction included Yom, the god of the sea, and Mat, the god of death, as well as burning and pestilence. And, you know, again, a god described in the Bible, Habakkuk 3, Deber, there you could see in some places that these myths have, have lived on in a recognizable way if you're familiar with the mythology. Again, uh, somebody said uh, once, all I need is the Bible. I got everything. <laughs> it's like, you got nothing. You're in the dark. You're blindfolded in the dark. You got, you know, earmuffs on. Your nose is pinched off. You can't s- taste anything, see anything, smell. You have nothing, nothing at all but what they've given you. If that's your viewpoint, because again, it, you might as well believe every word out of CNN uh, if you're going to, you know, go along with <laughs> that mindset. So in total, more than 234 deities recorded in these texts. And so when you view this, and and this does, it it occurs in in tradition after tradition, in, in myth after myth. And in some places, we get much clearer uh, visions of this than others. So El and Yahweh, many will say El turned into Yahweh. But are they actually different beings? And when I, I asked Cindy about this years ago, what do you feel when we talk El? And what do you feel when we talk Yahweh? And, and they're not the same energy. This is, and she, she's shaking her head like, uh-uh, no, 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 no. These are not the same energies. And, uh, no, I mean, this is one, one thing that I can do is I can look at different energies, give me a name, and I, I can tell you, okay, these two energies are blended. They're the same. They have the same soul stream. Or no, these are just two completely different entities altogether. And so with El and Yahweh, the energy is not, uh, it doesn't feel the same. No, no, they don't feel the same at all. Very different. Yeah. Y- Yahweh is is a very, very dark energy. He's a difficult energy, very difficult to deal with. Something that where what I can see with his energy, stepping into his energy, if you don't do as you're told, he just is not going to have anything to do with you. You're simply not going to exist. So he ruled out of fear. And the energy of L in comparison. Energy of L, it's like I, I see a completely, like, it's a, cl- it's a, a white cloud. It's, it's a very uplifting energy, L. Yeah, so what we have here, again, is another instance of the change of the yugas and the power structure changing. The beings that are around us change. So when you look at L, L is a being that you might encounter in a uh, age like the end of the silver, the silver age, where Yahweh is more that that's coming in right at the beginning of the dark age. And again, they step into and try to take over uh, the place. It's just like when, when a king is killed and somebody else takes in and becomes a new king. And the titles that the king had whatever it is lord of glory are, are the highest king in the king you know whatever it is those titles get bestowed on the usurper mm-hmm. and and that's sort of kind of what we have going on now that those who have the main control are controlling i mean how could if it's such a, a benevolent god then how do we have people like uh gil bates in charge doing what he's doing how yeah. yeah, how do you have 46 and crew and all those putting their hands on the B-I-B-L-E, smiling as they do it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, this is a, a clear you, usurp, usurpation of power. So it isn't that El became Yahweh. No, these are distinct beings. These are two distinct beings. And it is interesting, too, because... Again, there's different classifications of gods. There's different classes of gods. There's gods that are serving gods to the higher level gods. 
So when we see the caste system that uh, was brought into effect in India, and many people have even thought that uh, that whole Aryan invasion thing isn't exactly as we're told. Yeah, you know, it's not. And, and again, everywhere we look, history has been been rewritten all the religious texts everywhere have been touched to a degree, some more than others. The ones that are in most common use are obviously going to be far more of the controller's uh, paradigm, and it's going to be you know part of their sales. It's really all sales. But we do have different classifications of gods, just like we have the EGG serving uh, the Anunnaki, and of course the Anunnaki serve the Draco. It, it's kind of like, you know, crap rolls downhill, so to speak. And then they created, well, they didn't really create, because what the word is, again, that's used, like when it talks about the creation of mankind, this is going to be in another video. Uh, it's not creation. It's more like alteration. And this is what we've been saying the whole time. What they did was that they took what was here developing naturally and in an actual much higher state of, of spiritual being, and they altered it. And the evidence is in our DNA. It's right there in our DNA. So Yahweh is what comes about and usurps El. And again, Elohim is a remembrance of the rulers of those quote-unquote gods that are not gods. I mean, these are not... Uh, they're not even truly uh, creator beings. These these are more, again, beings that are more akin to intergalactic pirates of a sort, plundering and pillaging. And when we see so much of how the world works, this is their lineage. So, you know, that's the first word there. Now, did they make the earth? No, they didn't make the earth either. The earth, was <laughs> in fact, uh, you know, they could probably try to lay claim to making the earth because uh, the power structure that they serve did destroy Tiamat as it was. And then the creative forces got together and rebuilt and remade Tiamat or what was left of Tiamat into earth. That's what we hear, have now, and we've done videos on that, on the superconscious and how Earth was able to reposition herself and how many different beings and entities came in to help that. But I, I think I want people to remember and take away today, um, as above, so below, and look at our control system. You know, the politicians, they all have different levels of control. And then there's others that are above the politicians and others that are above those politicians. And in some different world, in, in you know, 50 or 100 years from now, in certain books, they might just call these beings gods because they had extra kinds of... Um, powers where they could just you know rule over people and are they not ruling over people and they're not very nice about it either so again when we look at some of the meanings to the word elohim and again just look at genesis one uh yeah it could be rulers could be judges could be gods with the plural superhuman beings mighty ones or those from above so you know again it's it's not at all what we've been taught if we are looking at things from a personal um, modern day fundamentalist point of view so who are the Elohim absolutely the answer sh will rattle your theology because you know again this is this is the revisionist history that we have from the be from the beginning you know and it's a it's a change from polytheism or what we would call polytheism, which really wasn't even that, because we're not worshiping, we weren't worshiping uh, beings that represented you know different archetypes or anything, and they weren't even beings that were in quote unquote heavenly realms. They were they were beings that were walking amongst humans. And it's interesting, too, because they were very, very human-looking. 
in fact, again, as you know, Genesis 6, they mated with humans and had offspring. So very, very human, more human than human, if we could even say. So El and Yahweh, absolutely not the same uh, beings. El is used in, in, in many instances in the Bible. And again, just type in the word Eloist and you'll see it. It'll start talking about the different parts of the Bible where that term El is used to denote God or Lord. And then Yahwist, because it'll give you examples of where Yahweh or yod heh vah is, is used uh, to denote God. And then there's also, we have Elohim and other words as well. And while they're kind of taken to be synonymous in today's thought, they weren't in the original texts. And we showed you a depiction of El, and, and this is the oldest depiction we have of Yahweh. Yeah, and it, what does it look like? It looks like what I've seen some African tribes um, dressing up as with masks and, and other places too. We have a, a lot of beings coming in and, and taking advantage of, of other beings and being able to step in and take charge and start to mold and guide things in a way that is going to be most advantageous for them. It's not that they're leading them around and doing what's best. I mean, it, you can just look at the world that we have today and the leadership we have today, and there's no way I can look at anyone that's in a seat of power, in a position of power, and say that they're looking out for me and my family. No, we look around and people are so sick right now and bad things are happening, and those are the ones that are in charge and they're able to hold their seat. We have only fragments. Uh, when you go back to 200 BC, only fragments, just little brief lines here, one line here, one phrase there of Old Testament uh, books. And yet we have this from 839 BC, which says, Amariah said to my Lord, may you be blessed by Yahweh of Samaria and by his Asherah. Yahweh bless you and keep you and be with you. Yahweh of Samaria, if it's the source of all, the creator of everything, how could it be of just one particular location? You know, right there, that's another obvious clue. And, you know, again, it's, it's understandable as kids, it's hard for us to let go of believing in Santa Claus because the most magical day of the year that day that makes you tingle, that you are so excited for. It's something that just, and, and not just the day, but the holiday season. And when we realize it's not what we were told, that, you know, even when we look at the Christmas season, well, you know, again, it doesn't really look like Yeshua was really born at that time of year. And, it, and the Yeshua that's portrayed, you know, his mission is not the mission that he really went out on. He, he wasn't a blood sacrifice. No, he was trying to teach us about the system and, and, and to get out of the system. How you get out of the system? By rising above it. So, yeah, if Yahweh comes from Samaria... It's not the creator of the universe. Hello. I mean, that's just obvious. And Yahweh, again, is depicted there. And this is far older than anything we have biblical. In fact, when we go to the oldest Hebrew full, full account of the five books of Moses, we're looking at, you know, somewhere between 700 and it's probably not even 700 A.D., it's more likely to be uh, in that 800 to 1,000 uh, year A.D. That's a long time. <laughs> 2,000 years going from these pictures of who Yahweh is to what, you know, you have the Old Testament saying Yahweh is. Yeah, absolutely. What does it mean that God came from Teman? Because, again... You see, Habuku 3 consists of a hymn of praise to God. Verse 3 begins a section that says, God came from Teman, Yahweh came from Teman, the Holy, Holy One from Mount Paran. You know, and again, you have the whole, 
you, you have people going to study theology to figure out ways to answer this question when the logical answer is, and, and I should finish and say, you know, to answer this question from the point of modern day fundamentalist point of view, the answer is the modern day point of view is not the accurate one. It, these stories have been revised. It's clear. Teman was a city or region in southern Edom to the east of Israel. So, you know, again, Yahweh of Samaria, Yahweh of Teman. Obviously, this is not the creator of the earth. This is not the creator of the universe. Clearly not. This is just a singular being that ends up being portrayed as the creator, but is not the creator. And we saw Roman emperors make themselves out to be gods. They declared that they were a god because, again, they were given kingship or emperorship uh, from on high, from those that came from the, the stars, those that came from other places and established their dominance on planet Earth and then handed off the reins to certain bloodlines and, and other beings that would carry out their will. I, you know, I look at the, the church and gosh, they have so much power. They have so much power and, and it's just not normal. And all of the things that have happened behind the scenes that they, they try to cover up. How can this, how can this be? How can it be? We're being led innocently by a creator who just simply loves us. No, it's, these are, these are beings from a different system they had nowhere to go they needed to come to a place and they are taking advantage but i see that their time is definitely it, it's running out we're fixing to change in vibration and, and it's not going to be where the toleration of vibrations it's gonna have to separate soon so these inscriptions mention blessings by the names of Yahweh of Samaria and Yahweh of Teman. Like all ancient Near Eastern gods, these two regional gods must have had central temples. This article examines their possible locations and suggests that the combination of Kuntalet Arjid inscriptions with the 8th century prophecies of Amos and Hosea holds the key for identifying these. In light of a detailed analysis of Hosea and Amos's prophecies, it first suggests that Yahweh of Samaria was the name of the major god of the kingdom of Israel and that his main temple was located at Bethel and that Yahweh of Teman was the name of the god of the southern desert regions and his temple was located at Beersheba. Israelite traders who traveled southward probably visited the latter god's temple, offered him sacrifices, made vows to repay him if they succeeded in the expedition, and thus turned him to be their patron god during their travel in the desert region. Now this comes from older traditions when these people were actually in charge. The deities were in charge. Just like, again, in our ancient times, if you were going through a particular area and you were nervous <laughs> about being attacked and all, you might go to the local lord, right? You might go to the local landowner and ask for protection. And, you, and again, you might give a sacrifice. You might pay them off, you know, pay for protection. This is, this is how the systems always worked. So these gods were literally rulers and they came down from elsewhere and they ruled over uh, the humans here on earth making themselves out to be gods. But the reality is, yeah, they had a lot more knowledge of how the universe works. They had a lot more technology and, you know, they found that people would worship them. There's stories of uh, people in uh, some of these Pacific Islands in World War II literally uh, making up places of worship for those that were fighting the war that had ample food, ample resources, you know, were able to fly in the sky. 
some of these islanders thought that you know people fighting world war ii were literally gods having their wars again again is the key the wars of the gods are real and we will see them again in the times to come indeed so hope you guys got something out of this and again uh, I think this is the way to go because, you know, going in deeper into one small subject, hopefully it'll shed some light. Again, you know, things are not uh, like they're made out to be. And so do your own research, deep dive, and you will probably be surprised. I think so. Maybe blessed by the true creator of this universe. Namaste. Namaste.